Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Dr. Samuel West. For years, I struggled to find the clarity of purpose in my life and the single-minded focus that I had when I was an athlete. You know, it just felt like I was working hard but not really getting any closer to where I wanted to go. And to be honest, I really didn't even know or have a clear vision on where I wanted to go. Then I discovered a powerful four-step blueprint that I began to apply to my life, and it changed everything. Now, every morning, I'm excited to attack the day because I have a clarity of purpose, and I have confidence in my plan, and I have peace of mind in knowing that I'm back on that path to elite success. Anyone, and I mean anyone, can use this four-step process to recreate the key elements in the life of an elite performer so you can regain that clarity of purpose and that single-minded focus so that you can both achieve your goals and live a balanced life. I created a a free PDF for you outlining the four-step Reveal Your Path Blueprint for Success just go to jimharshawjr.com slash blueprint. That's jimharshawjr.com slash blueprint to get instant access to that free PDF. Curator and founder of the Museum of Failure in Sweden. The Museum of Failure is a collection of interesting innovation failures. The majority of all innovation projects fail And the museum showcases these failures to provide visitors a fascinating learning experience. The collection consists of failed products and services from around the world, including Google Glass, Apple Newton, and Harley Davidson Perfume. Dr. West is a licensed clinical psychologist who transitioned into organizational psychology with a focus on innovation. After a visit to the Museum of Broken Relationships in Zagreb, Croatia, he decided to create the Museum of Failure, which just opened as of airing this. This will be just after it opened. So it opened June 7th, 2017. As usual, if you don't have time to listen to this entire episode or if you hear something you like but don't have time to jot it down, make sure you grab your free copy of the Action Plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action and grab your free PDF copy of the action plan from this episode. Dr. West, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you. So what led you to start the Museum of Failure? Um, There's basically two sort of stories there. One is that I've, I mean, I've been in the innovation business for almost 10 years and you know, business literature, definitely the innovation literature, uh, conferences and everything, it's all focused on, on success and the success, success stories. Um, and they, um, they're they all quite similar to each other. Uh, and I kind of just got fed up with the success stories. And I mean, in, in the innovation business, 80 to 90% of all innovation projects, they fail. But we don't talk about these failures. They, we just know they exist, and then people sort of sweep them under the carpet. And I got fed up with the success, success stories and started sort of getting more and more obsessed with failure. Um, that's one sort of reason. And the other one was, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, after a visit last summer at this to this awesome museum uh, called the Museum of Broken Relationships, I it just had – I just – it was mind blown seeing how they took an abstract concept of broken relationships and and managed to make a museum with with physical items and stories. I I just knew right there and then I I need to open a, a real museum. I can't just do a book or a workshop or something. It has to be a real museum. 
So 80 to 90% of innovations fail. Why don't we hear that? Why is that, why is that exactly. not part of the story? Exactly. Um, why? I mean, I mean, especially, especially when it comes, when it comes to innovation, um, it is risky. Um, companies know this and they know that, you know, there's a high likelihood that they'll fail. Um, but when they do fail, they, they keep it sort of, uh, they try to hide it or try to ignore the failures and that prevents them from learning from the failures. I mean, I understand if a company doesn't want to publicly broadcast their failures. I, I mean, I get that, but if some, most companies even sort of keep it secret within the company, uh, what, how they failed. And that that's really a bad basis on which to build learning. You know, I, find it interesting that uh, I interviewed a guy named Jason McKenzie, episode 84, and it's a great episode for, for the listener if you're interested in checking this one out, episode 84 with Jason McKenzie. And he talks about vulnerability and really sharing your true and honest self. So we talk about individuals who are successful. Well, when we learn about their failures, when they're vulnerable, when they express and, and share their failures, it doesn't make you and I look at them as lesser, it, which oh. we think that's kind of intuitive. We would think that, but it's the opposite. It builds credibility and we actually trust that person more. We believe in them more and we tend to gravitate towards those people. And, and, and you it, know, if they're a coach or if they're, they, they, you buy from them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I'd like to add to that. I totally agree. And I would have to say that they're more interesting. Um, I have, I don't know if this is off subject here, but I, I have a good friend, a uh, couple. I've known them for ages, and they like to travel. Anyway, so every time they've been someplace exotic, um, we meet up and like, okay, so, you know, how was your trip? And um, uh, the woman, she always talks about it. it was so wonderful, and we had a wonderful time, and you know, everything is so <laughs> honky dory, yeah. beautiful, awesome, and fantastic experiences. And then when she takes a pause and it's his turn to tell about his trip, it doesn't seem like they've been on the same trip because he says, he, <laughs> he, you know, he describes the, the good parts, but then he also says, yeah, and then we missed the train and then that happened and you lost your wallet. And then, and he sort of <laughs> adds those sort of failures to the story. And it's not just me, but his version of the trip is always far more interesting than hers. Uh, because it's more nuanced. Yeah, and you probably get a truer sense of what that experience was really like. And it's interesting. That's what we're seeing on social media now. You know, nobody posts on Facebook. Uh, just got in an argument with my wife, or had a. Uh, <laughs> my kids hate me. You my kids, yeah, my kids hate my kid. You know, my teenager just slammed the door in my face, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, just dropped my dinner on the floor. Uh, you know, they're not posting that. Like they're posting. You know, everybody posts all these great, amazing things, and and so we get this distorted view, I think, of of other people and of reality, right? I mean, and I mean, what do you feel like that does? I mean, not only in businesses, but the psychology of society and culture. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 we project the image that we want others to perceive us as, and that's our sort of finest side or, or, or aspects. But I mean, that's fine. As long as you also, I mean, like, like you said, um, people don't think less of you because they see that you're human. It's, it's, it's quite on the contrary. If you, if you present yourself as, as human, I, I have my, you know, strong sides and my successes, but I also have some of the, you know, the, the less beautiful sides of myself. Those are also part of who you are. Um, and it doesn't have to be sugar coated in, into some kind of package. Like I, I'm really, I'm, I'm really ashamed of this aspect of my life and I'm really working hard to change it. Sometimes there's just things you can't change and that doesn't distract or diminish who you are. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't I know if I'm, if I've worked 10 years before this in, in clinical psychology, I can't help to think about how we deal with uh, in, like negative emotions and, and emotional sort of uncomfortable content in our lives. And what we try to do is we avoid it. So there's a, a clear avoidance strategy of not, you know, remembering unpleasant memories or dealing with unpleasant sort of uh, internal behavior. Um, and the, 
The problem is that you can't select it. There is no filter. You have to take the rose with the thorns. Um, and, I, and I feel the same way when it comes to these, this, this uh, museum of failure and the whole theme sort of surrounding it, that we, we're, I'm tired, uh, people are tired of trying to filter and select only the good parts of life, only the good parts of, in this case, innovation. Um, and I think we need, to, I mean, we're, we, we're sort of hungry for the whole story. Yeah, how do we, how do we change that filter? How do we get more of the full story? I, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I try to do that through my podcast. I mean, it's really one of the missions of my podcast is to normalize failure and to normalize <laughs> the experience of, of struggling to succeed at relationships, mm-hmm. at health, mm-hmm. at wealth, at parenting, anything else. Life, I mean, how, how life. We, how do we, yeah, how do we bring more of that into our lives? I mean, any suggestions or thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm, um, I've really tried to not sort of give a three-step plan on how to do things um, because that would obviously open up to a lot of failure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I mean, I do think a big aspect of, of, of what I want to sort of convey with the museum is that accepting failure, not glorifying failure, I'm not, um, that's not what I'm talking about, but accepting failure as a necessary aspect of any kind of development, whether it's innovation for a company when it comes to a product or for you as an, as an individual, then we ha- it's a risk. I mean, you're gonna, when, you try, when you learn something new or you try a new skill or try to perfect something, you're, you're going to fail. And if you don't accept that, it's, gonna be, it's very difficult to make any kind of progress. Um, so what I want to do is, is like, like the, your ambition to normalize failure, not glorify it, but just, hey, accept it and don't be so afraid of it. Sure. And you mentioned not glorifying it, but you've gotten a lot of media. You've gotten, and, and certainly it's not, you know, I'm not saying you're glorifying it or the media is not glorifying it, but I think they kind of latch onto that. You know, why, why yeah. are people so fascinated? Why do you think people are fascinated with failure? Um... Are they right, I, are they interested I, I, in seeing the real truth that failure happens? Is it is it that we're kind of hungry to see I, that 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 failure is normal? Yeah. Okay. I think um, I think one aspect is definitely the fact that when it comes to these these brands, these mega corporations that are, that are represented in the Museum of Failure, um, they have huge sort of brand management departments and PR departments whose only function is to make sure that the the brand is is uh, positively associated with only positive associations and we're i think by showcasing these failures and saying hey there's more to this story than than the successes and i think people are hungry for that when it comes to the, the actual products in the museum so when you see the the failures of microsoft and google and apple they're like okay that's that feels kind of good because they're not all that great as they they claim to be. Yeah, I knew there I was think, some BS there. I knew that uh, there was something they were hiding behind the curtain, and now you <laughs> see behind the curtain, and you go, ah, oh, okay, yeah. okay, they I are mean, that's, actually real. That's definitely one aspect. There, there's a German and a Swedish word for this. It's skade gladje, skade in German. It's the, the joy you feel or the joy you experience when someone else is is hurt or somebody else um, somebody else is suffering. Um it's kind of a, yeah, it, it, as a concept, it's like, you know, you see, you see somebody else, uh, you know, have, a, have a, a bad time. You're like, okay, yeah, that actually feels kind of good to see that. Um, yeah, like that, uh, like the arrogant neighbor you have that, that says he has everything <laughs> yeah. and then he finally yeah. tells you, yeah, his, awesome, that yeah, kind of feels he good. Got, he, he wrecked his BMW, <laughs> right. like, all right, serves you right. <laughs> right, you go walking over, kind of, you yeah. know, tilt your head, like, yeah, sorry that Perk happened. On your face. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I think there's some element of of, of Scott Dufresne in there, but um, I also think okay, I don't uh, maybe I'll illustrate this with a little story. Um, my my uh, I think there's a change going on in how we see failure. Um, the fact that you have an entire show uh, um, about failure that focuses on learning from failure. Um, okay, so my daughter, she's 16 years old. Uh, you know. Uh, High school, I, I, the other day I caught her um, digging in my work bag. She has no business, you know, digging in my in my work bag. And she's, uh, 
uh, and she steals some of the stickers that I have for the museum. They're little round sort of badges that I put on people that visit the museum or, or come to, you know, the, the pop-up museum. Little orange sticker. There's nothing special about them. I'm like, why, why on earth? I have thousands of these stickers. What, why, are you, why are you stealing or why are you taking these stickers? And then she explains. And how old is your daughter? She's 16. Okay. Anyway, so then she explains to me that uh, her, all her friends, everybody at school, they identify with this. So they don't, even, they don't even understand what the Museum of Failure is about. But they love the, the idea of associating themselves with failure. So the, her friends stick these stickers on their iPhone cases, on their computers. They want to, like, it's cool. Failure is cool. <laughs> um, and I've tried to sort of wrap my head around it. What's going on? Like, why is... Why does I'm too old to know what's cool, but um, mm-hmm. like what makes a 16 year old think that this is cool? And and you know I'm trying to piece things together, and the only thing I can sort of the only explanation I you know I can draw is that the uh, that she's fed up with this sort of curated perfect view of life, and in the magazines on on TV, Instagram, everybody's perfect, beautiful, and happy. Yeah, and especially for young girls, the, the body yeah, image problems. And, Gosh. and that's not how life is. Right. And, and then all of a sudden somebody says, hey, we have a whole museum here about failure. And they just, you know, jump all over it. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So let's talk about some of the exhibits. I mean, what mm-hmm. what are some of your favorite exhibits? I, I, I came across, I learned about the Museum of Failure because of an article in, I think it was the Washington Post, and uh, did some, you know, Google searching and background on you. And you had some really cool, funny videos and sort of in a failed innovations out there. Can you share a handful of those with us? Yeah, I, I've got 70 right now at the museum, at the, at the permanent museum. So there's a lot of them. Um, everything from like products, stupid products that should not actually ever have existed, like the, the big pen for her. Um, so, so it was a pen it's just a for pen women <laughs> made by Bic, this huge company, French right. company. Um, and so they, they, in 2011, they developed a pen, especially for women. Um, and it, and it didn't it's a regular off. pen <laughs> in female feminine colors with glitter on it and stuff. And they cost twice as much as a regular pen. Um, and, and the interesting you know, thing is somebody who has a degree in marketing, probably an advanced degree. Oh. They probably get paid a lot of money and yep. they said, and, and there's probably a team of them mm-hmm. who approved, who developed this and worked on this and then approved it. And then somebody, the head of marketing who makes even more money said, yes, I give that the green light. That's a go ahead. Let's do this thing. Let's do this. Let's right? sell pen for her. Yeah. Educated, smart, makes a lot of money, probably mm-hmm. has a lot of success mm-hmm. in their background and they flopped. Yeah, and I think it's. I mean, the the you know the lessons from the the big pen for her, at least the obvious one is, you know, don't they have any women on the you know on the marketing team or the, the <laughs> innovation team, uh, or did do they not listen to people who have uh, different views? Is there nobody who voiced the concern and said, "Hey guys, this is stupid," you know? Right. Uh, did they say it and then they got you know ignored? What's going on there? So that's one of those products. I would say there's not. It's not like a fantastic innovation, but there's a. It's definitely a failure. Um, and uh, yeah, the the product just they should never have, have launched it. Now let's talk about um, the one that uh, you know everybody thinks of. You know, two that I mentioned in the in the buy in the intro here was were Apple and Google, right? We think of them as these amazing giants of innovation who just roll out things that people want and that they're hungry for. Tell us, give us, give us those, let's yeah, talk about I those mean, examples. Both of, both of these companies have, have, you know, tens, if not twenties of big, big failures. Apple has, everybody sees Apple as this sort of infallible, perfect uh, company that just launches the perfect uh, devices year after year. Yeah, uh, That's not always been the case. Uh, they've got about 20, 25 sort of big flops. Um, the one I have at the museum is, I've got two Apple products at the museum. One is the Apple Newton. I mean, no museum of failure would be complete without the Apple sure. Newton. Sure. Uh, yeah. they, they launched it. Um, it's a little, it's like, it's, 
it's a handheld sort of per personal digital assistant. And the whole revolutionary thing with it was that it had a handwriting recognition. So you use a stylus to to write on the screen instead of a keyboard. And I mean, this was this was high tech stuff back when it was launched. When it was it launched, approximately? I, I, my uh, memory is fading here. I think it was in the early nineties, mid nineties. Yeah. I'm not sure now. Um, and then when they launched it, it was like, Hey, this is going to completely change. Like Apple still does. This is a revolution. It's going to change everything. Right. Um, and they truly believe that. Yeah, it was. And it, it's a great, it's an, it's beautifully designed. It's, it, it is cool. It's really cool. And there's no keyboard. Um, uh, anyway, so they launched this, this, uh, this device, uh, but, and hyped it up with the handwriting recognition. It's all launched then. And it's expensive as Apple <laughs> as is their, uh, tradition. Uh, and, uh, the handwriting recognition doesn't work. So people, <laughs> the Simpsons made fun of it, uh, comic strips. Everybody was having a heyday with the Apple Newton. Uh, you know, their key, the key function didn't work. Yeah. I, I think it's important to recognize that, that you can believe in big things and you can go on and fail and have people ridicule you in public and this is obviously a corporation we're talking about, but it's the same for people. You know, you can have people uh, ridicule you in public, and but you can still go on. You can learn from that because that's one yeah. of your core tenets is learning from this failure. You can learn from that and, and be better for it, not worse. So I'm going to give you an example from my life. As a wrestler in college, I was convinced by my coach that I was going to beat the number one undefeated ranked wrestler in the country, a guy named Lincoln McAravey. For the wrestling fans out there, you know who he is. He was a three-time national champion and one-time runner-up. Uh, I was not the individual who beat him the year that he didn't win. But uh, uh, but <laughs> but I walked onto the mat 100% truly believing, just like Mac or just like Apple believed that this product was going to succeed and Bix believed their product was going to succeed. I believed that I was going to beat this guy. I went out and I got my clock cleaned. I got beat so bad, it was the worst beating that I'd ever taken. <laughs> and But I walked off the mat and I realized... The only opportunity that I had was to believe in that that belief got me further than than it might have otherwise and that belief I carried that into other matches and I started winning more matches against higher ranked opponents because the simple simple fact that I believed regardless of whether or not I failed and so so that was a huge lesson that I learned from the biggest failure of my wrestling career so it's uh so, it's a very relevant relevant story I, I, can I ask you a question yeah yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, within sports psychology, w athletes, what's what's the take? Like, how do you? Is there learning from failure there? I mean, do, is there a is there a culture of, hey, we screwed up at our our football game, or we did this, and let's instead of sort of bashing each other, pointing fingers at whose fault it was, or or blaming the weather, or blaming you know other other uh, uh, other factors out of our control is there a tradition do you feel like that you actually learn from the mistakes or it, yeah it's a great question it depends on the coach and it depends on your experience so i was blessed and lucky enough to have grown up and been exposed to many 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 different coaches and olympians and all americans and national champions just just high mm -hmm. high performing people and those are the people mm -hmm. who 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 can tell you th these are the type of people who learn from failure, right? The successful people. Yeah. And it's yeah. not that they don't fail. It's that they've failed. And, and instead of quitting or lowering their goals or giving up or just kind of ignoring that failure and moving to the next thing without learning, those are the people who, who, who succeed if they've actually learned from it. And, and so, you know, one of the things that, you know, I was really blessed to have my, my father didn't know anything about wrestling and we watched every he filmed every match that I ever wrestled starting when I was like nine years old. And we watched most, you know, mostly we spent time almost exclusively watching my losses, which is, you know, which is a hard thing to do. It's not yeah, it fun. Hurts. Yeah. It hurts. No. But that's really where you learn because the guy who beats you is the one who exposed your, your weaknesses. Yeah. And so that's, that's where you learn from that failure. But that's not, it's not the case for everyone. And it's something that truly has to be reinforced into you because when you fail, it's easy for me to say, yeah, you learn from failure. Easy for you to say, yeah, we learn from failure. But it's like when we fail, we're not saying it doesn't hurt. We're not saying no, it doesn't it suck. Yeah. We're not saying it doesn't cause 
doubt and and a loss of you know financial loss, emotional loss, all these other losses that can happen. But your failure, if you choose to look at it and learn from it, you can learn for yourself and you can learn and, and help others and make the world a better place if 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 your failure is is such a such a failure that that people other people can actually learn from it. Yeah, I mean, if you're willing to, if you're willing to deal with that uh, emotional discomfort or uncomfortable emotional sort of um, um, content of of seeing your own failure, talking about it, and actually sort of um, uh, bridging that temporary pain uh, of, of, of 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 you know of dealing with your own failure, then you can learn from it. But the thing is, you have to sort of break through that initial hesitation there. Um, and it is difficult. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I, I, I hate failing yeah. um, myself and, and I, I'm not, I'm not some kind of, uh, I'm not a guru on, Hey, this is how you're supposed to, you know, uh, deal with your own failures. I'm just saying that we need to give failures more attention and pay more attention to them than we have been doing. Yeah. And I, I feel sorry for, um, also this might be way off topic here, but I, when I hear sort of the, the rhetoric of, um, you know, be all that you can be, believe in yourself. You can do that. We, that we sort of the propaganda we feed young people of you can be anything you want to. If you have a dream, you can follow it. You can be successful. Just go for it. Um, there is a, another side to that. And that is, yes, you should believe in yourself. You should go and have, uh, you know, great dreams and lofty ambitions, but you're not going to get there without some pain. And right. we don't deal with that. We don't teach our young people. We don't either by example or, you know, um, with, with, with our messages that to get there, you have to deal with setbacks. You have to deal with failures. Yeah. Um, and I think it's lacking. I, I think it's severely lacking in the whole sort of our messages to young people that we try to inspire them by saying it's easy to be successful. That's, that's bullshit. Right. Yeah. It's not a matter of just going, you know, believe and, and, and it all happens. And it's like, no. no, like you have to build into the mentality that there will be obstacles, period. I mean, if you, if you're one of the lucky ones who doesn't have, have an obstacle, good for you. You're like one in a billion. But, exactly. and, and we, we sometimes think of that. We sometimes, not even sometimes, we most of the time, we look at the national champion athlete, the Super Bowl champion quarterback, the, the business owner who sells for an IPO, the the entertainer who's up on stage, we we go, oh man, they just picked up a guitar and now look at them up on stage singing to the world. They're just really good. We don't see that you know a year into it they wanted to quit, or you know five years into it they were told by somebody that uh, yeah you're just not good enough, you can't play in this mm -hmm. band or whatever. We don't see that. We think oh. that their trajectory was different than ours because all we see is the highlights. Right, we just hear the the great success stories and how they signed the contracts and this great things happen. We don't see the pain and suffering of laying in bed in the middle of the night, staring at the ceiling. People saying, "What the hell am I doing? Yeah. Am I good enough? Can I really do this?" I just had an experience yesterday that made me believe that I can't. Maybe I need to quit. Maybe I need to change course. We don't see that, and that needs to be oh. exposed. Oh. Yeah, it needs to be exposed. We need to. I mean, I, I um. We need we need to at least um, create a forum or uh, a validation, some kind of acceptance of that we that we we have to create some kind of space for that with our kids, with with our clients, with 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 the, the people we interact with, whether it's business or, or private, that, and say like you know it's okay to talk about your setbacks. It's okay. You're not. You know, it's not. It's not just complaining or or ruminating. It's actually hey, let's. Let's deal with this. Let's find out what we could do better and, you know, how we can prevent the bigger disasters in the future. Right. So can you give us a couple more uh, in, uh, innovation failures yeah. from the museum? Um, um, uh, which Google, Let's go uh, Google Glass. How about that Google one? Glass. Because we all, we're all Glass familiar with that. Yeah. The, um, so this is only, this is 2013, 14. So it's not that long ago. Right. Um Google Glass, it's awesome. Uh, it's you know, it looks they look like uh, sun, like really cool futuristic sunglasses. Um, the thing, the the innovative thing about them is that they have a prism screen. So 
with your when you wear these glasses there's a you know if you look off into the the the, the distance there in front of you, you can the, the the screen sort of projects an image the data or whatever the image right in front of you it's like it's really cool i can't describe it so you have um, one right in the museum if yeah, you yeah, turned it I on and use it yeah, I, it doesn't work that well. Like, it only works for about a minute at a time, and the battery dies. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've seen this. I've seen. I've seen. I've seen how it works. And it's got an inbuilt, a built-in camera, a microphone. It's got web, uh, Wi-Fi access. Um, it's really cool. So it's a really awesome piece of, of of technology. So what Google did wrong was that they hyped up this product, and they wanted opinionated people bloggers, tech uh, uh, journalists, the, the who's who of, you know, uh, Silicon Valley uh, opinion, opinionated people to, to buy these, the, the Google class, um, and then to write positive things about it. Um, so they sold them for $1,500. That's quite expensive. Yeah, that's uh, cheap. No, and they call them you know, the Google Explorers, like you're a select crowd that gets these glasses. Um, the problem was that this was a prototype. There were no applications for it. There was no real use for the Google Glass. Um, and it was full of bugs and it was kind of difficult to use. So um, these opinionated people, uh, they also have negative opinions. So once they started realizing that this is not all it's cracked up to be, they also uh, you know, wrote about it in a negative way. Um, so that's one mistake. The second mistake was that, like I said, that it was a prototype. There wasn't any real use for it. It was just a cool futuristic thing um and the the third problem which i think probably is the biggest one here and this is strange coming from google but the the privacy issues um there's a camera in it you're filming people sort of covertly um and the cafes uh, around san francisco i uh, was raised outside of san francisco the cafes out there um had signs like no dogs and no google class like um, not allowed into our cafes, and the people that used yeah. the Google Glass were called glass holes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. So, I mean, coming from Google, you'd think like, "Come on, Google, you 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 know all this stuff about integrity. Why right. would you do this? You know? Yeah, privacy, integrity. Yeah, right, right. So let's go with. Uh, how about a, is there a really weird one? Maybe it has to do something with like I, I don't know, like personal hygiene or. Uh, or sex, or something. Oh, something I've got a, yeah, something I've got be a really dildo. interesting. <laughs> I've okay, got a dildo. That's yeah, right. it's uh, the only not safe for work item I have. Uh, it's a. Um, I can't, how can I describe this thing? It's a. It's a dildo. Uh, a, sorry, not dildo. It's a sex toy. Um, that's a, the world's first gender neutral sex toy. <laughs> so. <laughs> So the box, it says it's for her, it's for him, it's for him and her, her and him, him and him, her and her. It's for, it's for everybody. It's, 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 it's supposed to satisfy everybody. Yeah. It, and it's actually, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's a, so it's, a, it's a, obviously a vibrating um, a dildo and then you can actually t twist it so you can bend it into any shape you want. Um, and the problem was uh, everybody really wanted to love this product because it was gender neutral and it was like, you know, it's for everybody. It's, 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 it's open. It's the future. Um, and, but it didn't satisfy anybody. Um, people hated it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's, job it, had. <laughs> it, it looks really spacey. It looks really cool. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a commercial flop. So what, uh, how about one more? You have another weird one, one interesting one, unique one. Uh, there's one that's the it's one of those products that's just kind of s silly, stupid. But um, it's a uh, the Rejuvenique facial mask. It's um, it looks oh, like yeah, a I saw this on the yeah, yeah, it looks website. like a torture. It looks like a <laughs> horror movie or something. Uh, it's a uh, it's a mask. You a hard plastic mask. You strap it onto your head, and then you shock your face for 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It looks horrible. I've tried it. It looks up. It feels horrible as well. Um, and yeah, if you use it for uh, every day for three months, then you would become as beautiful as Linda Evans. Linda Evans, that's right. Her, her yeah, pictures yeah. on the box, right? It's. I mean, it's. 
there's a video, a v, an old school VCR, sort of a cassette in the box. And um, Linda Evans says to the, the buyers of this product, she says, you know, I c- congratulate you for your uh, wise investment in this, this beauty device. Yeah. And then I found a review uh, of the product and the person wrote, it feels like a thousand ants are biting me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm sure there's a lot of great innovation failures in the museum. You are coming to the States in, uh, what is it, Miami in December? Is that right? Did I read that correctly I, off your website? Yeah, I, that's the only uh, engagement that's confirmed. There's other stuff that's still in limbo in San Francisco and in Detroit Okay. Uh, this, this fall. Well, if you have others that come about, let me know and I'll share it with my audience because I think people would be interested in checking out some of these innovation failures. Dr. Samuel West, thank you for making time to come on the show. Can you promote yourself a little bit? Where can people follow you, find you, find more information about the museum? That's uh, museumoffailure.se. And the reason it's SE is because when I tried to buy the museumoffailure.com, I misspelled museum, so I own the museumoffailure.com. <laughs> it's perfect for uh, museum of failure. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it at the time, but now it makes sense. Um, so museumoffailure.se, and of course on Facebook there's Museum of Failure. And it's in Sweden, southern Sweden. Um, come visit. Excellent. So for the listener, I will have links to everything he just shared there. In the action plan, as usual, Jim Harshaw Jr. <laughs> dot com slash action dr west thanks so much for making time to come on the show thank you bye-bye and for the listener until next time take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success